you very much. And I, I do want to thank Alex and, and Schengen for putting this together. Uh, I've had associations both with IFPRI, because as you heard, I was on the board for a brief period. It wasn't they threw me off. It's because when I became president of Rockefeller, I didn't feel I could stay on it and give them money. Well, in fact, I told them I'll stay on it, but you won't get any money. And they said, well, you better leave. <laughs> and um, the other one is that uh, in the 70s and 80s, I used to work a lot for USAID, particularly in Southeast Asia. In those days, it was quite easy for Brits to work there. And I think it was partly because they thought I was expendable. And I remember <laughs> in the 1980s, the late 1980s, I went to, uh, I was called to see the director of USAID in, in Manila. And he said to me, look, we've got a job for you. I said, oh, really? He said, yes. He said, there's a lake south of here called Lake Buhi. And we built a dam on the lake. Uh, and the people above the dam don't like it. And so they've got the New People's Army in there to protect it. And the New People's Army are armed and on the dam. And we want you to go down there and sort it out. And <laughs> there's a bulletproof car outside. And <laughs> would you please go and do it? And I went down with Professor... Uh, Percy Sahisi of the, Europe, uh, the University of the Philippines in Los Banos, and we sorted it out. Now, I could spend the rest of the talk talking about how we did that, but I won't. <laughs> you can read it in Ambio, if you ever want to. I always start talks with this slide. This is the world today, the crises. And every time I put it up, I look at it and I think, the problem is that each of those crises is getting worse and they're getting more and more interconnected. The other point is that nobody's in charge. There's no organization in charge of dealing with all those crises. So what we all do is we take on one of these crises for our own work and we try and move out to other crises along the way. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about food security and food insecurity. And within that, I'm going to largely focus on Africa, but what I'm going to say, I think, is globally um, applicable, and that may be a, a subject for discussion. So there are a range of threats and opportunities. The biggest, of course, is global hunger, particularly in Africa. And uh, this is uh, Schengen's uh, slide with his data, not his data, but I mean, that he put together. It shows that actually there has been a decline in the prevalence of hunger in quite a lot of Africa not in Central Africa, but other parts. But it's still very high. We've still got a long way to go before we can really say that we've got rid of hunger in Africa. But the big, real criminal event, if you like, is child malnutrition. We're talking about 40% of African children under the age of five being malnourished and stunted, growing up stunted, stunted mentally, stunted physically. I think it's a crime. We actually know what to do, it's just that we can't get around to doing it for one reason or another. So let's take my favorite lady. She doesn't really exist. Well, she sort of exists. She's called Mrs. Namarunda. She's in Western Kenya. She um, is a widow. Uh, she's got an elder son who turns up for photo shoots. He lives in Nairobi in brings a little bit of money from time to time. But then she's got four other children. You can't quite see them all. And she's got um, a hectare of land in Western Kenya, highly eroded land. And uh, with local maize varieties, local corn varieties that she can get from neighbors, she can probably get about uh, two tons per hectare. But the soils are bad. Long come the weeds and the pests and the drought, and she gets less than a ton per hectare. And with that, she can't feed her family. And that is true of millions and millions of small farmers in Africa. But there are ways out of this. Just to give you one example, this is a, a, another woman farmer in southern Ethiopia. She's got a modern corn hybrid. I think she got it from Pioneer. And she is growing it with the right kind of mixture of fertilizers for her land. 
right blender fertilizer. And in the front there, she's getting about uh, three tons per hectare with, um, with diammonium phosphate. But if she applies exactly the right amount of fertilizer for the land, which is the back lot of maize, back lot of corn on the, on the screen, and she adds boron because boron is deficient in that area, she can get four, five, six tons corn per hectare. I've seen the same thing in Mozambique, except they add lime instead of boron. In fact, all over Africa, you'll find farmers now who've managed to get hold of good hybrid corn seed, and they can get three, four, five, six tons per hectare, which is the European average. I, mean, I know it's a long way from Iowa's average of 11 tons, but still, if normally what you get is less than a ton, which is what normally African farmers get, just to get four, or five, six tons is transformative. And so you can think of a farm now where Mrs. Namarunda's farm, where she can buy a, a, a maize variety that will give her probably about three tons, and you do something about the soil fertility, she does something about soil fertility. She does something about the weeds, something about the pests and diseases, something about the drought, and she gets two tons per hectare. And that means on half her hectare, she can feed her family. And then the other half hectare, she can grow bananas or some other kind of crop and sell it and make some money because she needs money. <coughs> she needs money to send the children to school because it's never completely free and she needs money to buy medicines and other health care plus other things. <coughs> uh, some of the activist groups think you sh she shouldn't be doing this, that somehow it's wrong for small farmers to make money. They ought to stay picturesque and poor. I think it's what one of the great things that Canayo has done, that IFAD, is to transform the dialogue around smallholders. So, I and other people have argued that the answer is sustainable intensification. I sometimes did put the title up as being, is sustainable intensification the answer? But I said, no, the hell, it's the answer. <laughs> I've said enough asking the question, but there's lots of questions to be asked about it, and Mark undoubtedly will ask some of those questions. We've got to intensify. You know, the average yields of maize, corn in, in Africa is only just over one ton per hectare, the average yield. In China, it's uh, up to two or three, and uh, up to uh, over four or five, and so on. We have to intensify because we need more food, we need more nutritious food, and we need higher farm incomes and greater diversity of production. That's what the urban dwellers, whether they be in China or the USA or in, in Africa, want. They want more food, but they want more diverse food as well. But we have to produce that on the same amount of land with the same amount of water or less. So we've got to produce more with less. And that's the basis of, of the intensification that we have to undertake. And it has to be sustainable. That means you've got to be prudent about using insecticides and fertilizers and so on. Just to use exactly what is needed and no more. Very precise use of pesticides, if you are going to use pesticides. You've got to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Agriculture is a huge emitter of greenhouse gases overall. You've got to restore or improve natural capital. That means soil moisture, it means uh, natural enemies of pests, it means a whole range of biodiversity, which you've got to do at the same time. And you've got to strengthen resilience. The problem, of course, is this is a tall order. I know Norm Borlaug isn't alive anymore, and if he was in the audience, I would be rather more cautious about saying, this is going to be a hell of a lot more difficult than what you achieved, because what he achieved was remarkable. But it is. 
It's an enormous challenge. Part of the challenge is that we've got global warming. I, I, I know, I don't know whether there's anybody in this audience who doesn't think global warming is happening, but this is the best graph. These are global temperatures. People say, of course, last year was very hot because of El Nino. All the red bars in that diagram are El Nino bars. El Nino bars are always higher than previous ones. But El Nino bars get higher and higher every time. The last year it was particularly hot for the climate as a whole because of El Nino and because of global warming. That's what's happening. They're coming together. And we've got growth in future climates. You know, COP21, we've all agreed that we're going to try and get it down to two degrees in the future. That's not where we're headed. On present trends, we're about three and a half degrees by 2050. On present trends. And if you look at the one on the, on the right, uh, that's the four degree map. And just look at Africa there and look at those very dark areas on the map of Africa. That's where the temperatures are four, five, six degrees above pre-industrial. That's what will happen with four degrees and three and a half, it'll get pretty close to doing that too. And the problem is that the climate is already changing things in Africa. The growing seasons are getting shorter on the left. I was in uh, Ghana two or three years ago, and the rains came a month late, and they finished a month early, so they only had 100 days to grow rice. 100 days is not enough. And the temperatures are such that day degrees above 30 degrees reduce significantly the yield of corn in Africa. 2,000 experiments have shown that. It's happening now. This is not something for the future. So one answer is to be more precise about what we do. Precision farming is now well established in uh, advanced countries in the USA. We have it in Britain too. You can get tractors that will go up and down the field and will plow or will make a furrow within a few centimeters of where they did it last year. I mean, they're down to two to three centimeters uh, with the new <coughs> systems. You can get satellite imagery, which gives you exactly what's happening in your fields, and you can make sure that the tractor goes to the individual parts of the field which are short of water or fertilizer or whatever. Here's a, a tractor that will go up and down the field and will very precisely get rid of weeds as it goes. And we've now got these experimental little robot tractors which zip around fields. And when they come across a weed, they zap it. And then they go back to the farmer for a reward. <laughs> so a high voltage shock of some kind. Now some of that is going to happen in developing countries, but the, the principle is the same in developing countries. One example is microdosing. This is a um, <coughs> technique developed in uh, West Africa where you make the hole to put the maize seed in, the corn seed in. Sorry, I keep flipping out of American into English. It's, when I was at Rockefeller, I only spoke American, but now I sort of got back to speaking English from time to time. Anyway, corn. This is corn seed. You put in the... You put that in the hole with the seed. You put the fertilizer in the hole. And you can put the fertilizer in the cap of a soda bottle, a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi-Cola. It doesn't actually matter which brand, right? <laughs> so you just take the cap and you put that in the seed. And that way you're just putting the fertilizer exactly where it's needed. You're not spreading it all over the place. That's precision farming. Uh, drip irrigation is another example of precision farming. Really good example of precision farming. There are multiple approaches to sustainable intensification. There's ecological approaches, genetic, socioeconomics, and you can integrate them all. 
So let's take the ecological ones. This is where you take ecological principles, it's sometimes called agroecology, and you apply it to agriculture. One of the big objectives of this kind of farming is to reverse land degradation. Something like 25% or more of sub-Saharan Africa is severely degraded. This is not just degraded, it's severely degraded. This is the work of um, Joachim von Braun's Institute at the University of Bonn. All those red areas are severe degradation in Africa. Conservation farming is one approach. This is where you, this farmer here, she's cut down the corn and laid it on the ground and it lies there and gets incorporated until the next growing season. And in between, her husband is making these little holes where they're going to plant the new grain. A more sophisticated version of this will have you rotating this corn with a crop such as a, um, a legume to get more back into the soil. In fact, conservation farming, strictly speaking, is not just this minimum tillage, but also minimum tillage coupled up with the uh, use of a legume. And you can see in the background where normally they have a long fallow, so they cut down the forest, they leave it for about 15, 20 years, and then they plant the corn and go round again. But it may be that with conservation farming you can do it permanently. But conservation farming is very good, but it doesn't actually put a great deal of carbon back in the soil. It puts some, but not a lot. The problem is that agriculture contributes not just carbon dioxide, but methane and nitrous oxide. And methane and nitrous oxide are much more powerful in terms of global warming than carbon dioxide. Each individual little farmer doesn't do a lot. But the farmers in the world as a whole have done an extraordinary amount, and are still doing an extraordinary amount, of damage because of the emissions of greenhouse gases. And we don't know how to reverse that. The big problem is that farmers have learned and are learning how to adapt to climate change because the benefits occur relatively quickly. But to mitigate, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, there's no incentives for farmers to do that. The only possibility is to do it through co-benefits. And one example is agroforestry. Uh, this is a classic example of agroforestry where you have these trees called phytherbia, which shed their leaves during the wet season, which is sort of bizarre. But they shed their leaves in the wet season, and under those trees you can get about three tons per hectare without fertilizer, because of course they're leguminous trees, and you can get protein in the soil. And they will put about two to four tons of carbon back in the soil per hectare. And the standing crop is 10 to 20 tons. There may be other agroforestry, and the agroforestry people claim there are, that can do the same thing. But this is the only example that we've got where you can relatively quickly start to mitigate, and farmers can get some return. Otherwise, farmers are not going to get the return, and so it's very difficult to see what you can do. OK. There is then genetic intensification, where you try and bring various traits together to promote sustainable production. And a good example, of course, is uh, the new rices for Africa. These are uh, the crosses between the uh, African species and the uh, Asian species of rice that were developed at. Um, under Peter Matlin. Where is he? Forgotten you were going to be in the audience, but there you are. I, I put it there. And um, I remember that the story there is that uh, um, I've forgotten his name, who was working on it. Hmm? Monty Jones was working on this uh, at, uh, at, at the West Africa Rice Center under Peter. 
And Monty Jones couldn't get this cross to work. He, he, he put the, the, the two rice seeds, they crossed, they produced an embryo, but the embryo wouldn't grow. So you had to put it in a, uh, an agar mixture, in a Petri dish, to make the embryo grow. And he couldn't get it to work. And he came to Rockefeller and said, uh, I can't get this to work. And so somebody said, I don't know who said it, go to China. Maybe it was me. Go to China, they'll know what to do. So he bought him an economy air flight to China, and he went to China, and the Chinese said, add coconut oil to the mixture. And he added coconut oil, and it worked. And I think this was the biggest return for the few thousand, a few hundred dollars that we ever had. And then, of course, you've got the hybrid rices. Um, they're aiming for 20 tons per hectare now. When you see these hybrid rices, it looks as though you can walk over them. One of the big challenges are nutrients and disease. You can see on the left the orange sweet potatoes, which are a result of biofortification, and it's great because we've got Howdy here in the audience. So we've got all these pioneers in the audience, all these people who've done things, not just talked. It's really great. And um, that's done by, by conventional breeding. The golden rice is on the right, which, of course, again, at Rockefeller we supported. Um, and we can talk about that if we want, but it's fairly close, I think, to getting out onto the market. And uh, the blight-resistant potatoes, blight is a terrible disease, which, as you know, caused millions of deaths in, in Ireland in the 1850s. My grandfather lived there then and uh, uh, survived. Um, I think in Britain, the first GM crop to be released will be a blight-resistant potato. Just to make a point about GM crops, they're not all made by Monsanto and Bayer and all those people we love to hate, right? Surprise everybody's not just going at the sound of it. This is in Uganda, which is the center for breeding GM crops in Africa. They do more of it than we do in Britain. Phenomenal work. These are wilt disease that causes enormous damage to bananas. What is interesting about this is the, is, uh, the gene comes from sweet peppers, which was provided to us by Academia Sinica. It's in field trials. The whole thing is entirely government funded. It's funded by the British government, the American government, and of course the Uganda government. But you can do it. It doesn't have to be done by all the people you love to hate. And then thirdly is socioeconomic intensification, which is the big thing, in which you try and intensify the links between farmers and between farmers and value chains through farmer associations and co-ops and so on. And a lot of those linkages are facilitated by digital technology. And those of you who are interested, this uh, book in Foreign Affairs, which you can download for free, which we produced um, together, Kofi Annan and Sam Dryden, the former head of agriculture, and myself. And this book, uh, makes a number of arguments. One is that digital technology stops African farmers from being so isolated. It gives them communication. Communication with each other, communication with extension workers, communication with markets. And the other argument that I've been making is that it speeds up the process of transformation. You can use digital technology to make agricultural transformation go faster. You need inputs. Top left is my grandfather, the other grandfather, not the one who went to Ireland, who came from Ireland. This one came from Kent. And he used to go around the farms selling seed and fertilizer and everything else. And the lady down on the bottom right is his descendant, not literally, but sort of, you know, in terms of what she does. She's in a little agro dealer shop in a little village who's selling seed and fertilizer to farmers. And there's, now there's hundreds of these, if not millions of them, in Africa. And we pioneered a lot of that at Rockefeller. We opened many of those agro-dealers long ago in, the, in that time. And then most important are output markets. And one of the most important aspects of output markets are warehouses. 
On the right there is a warehouse in Uganda that's set up by four young men, entrepreneurs. The farmer associations, it has to be the farmer associations, provide the corn to the warehouse. It gets picked up by trucks going around the farms. It's stored in the warehouse. It's graded. It's fumigated. It's cleaned up. And it's still owned by the farmers. The farmers can ask for it back, or they can sell it whenever they like. And when I was there, the World Food Program came along and bought 500 tons. And it was the representatives of the farmer associations who negotiated that. And then when they take the grain out, they pay the fees for storing the warehouse in the warehouse. It's a very transparent, very equitable way of doing it. And of course, once you've got it into a warehouse and it's going on to market, then you're into value chains. And it's value chains that are really the most exciting thing these days to be working on. Lots of areas of research available to academics and available to people in companies. I mean, we, I know a lot of people in the big companies who are doing value chain research. I don't want to talk about a lot of it, but just very briefly, uh, this is Usman's graph. He didn't know I was going to cannibalize your talk the other day. A very good example, I think, of a what is a modern value chain based on a traditional crop, based on millet, which you can get processing, you can have traditional meals, you can put them together into meals on shelves. That's beginning to happen in Africa. One of the issues, of course, is that populations are growing in Africa. Even though for the world as a whole we're leveling out, there's no sign of it. In West and East Africa, the, 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 the populations are growing fast. And in particular, there are large numbers of young people. And one of the issues is, what are they going to do? Well, and it's the same for women. What, what are women going to do into the future? How are they going to be more productive? What answer is food, food processing? Uh, in many countries, it's the production of snacks, which is one of the first elements in a value chain. Here they're producing snacks of uh, soybean, I think, in Uganda. And then young people want to do things. This is remarkable. In Uganda, there's some young guys there who got a little factory that makes cob shellers. And they sell these cob shellers, but they will also lease them out. And of course, they all break down, so they need repair. So there's lots of jobs available for young people. And again, that's another example of where the agribusiness business is providing employment for young people and also for women. I just want to, this is, I put this in at the last minute. The other element of these value chains is insurance, because farmers are going to have to buy seed, they're going to have to buy fertilizer, they're going to have to do all these different things. And they tend not to do that because it's risky. So what we've been developing at Imperial College, a team led by a former PhD student of mine, Eric Chavez, is producing a big has produced a big mathematical construct that gives you the probability of extreme weather for a decade or more. And he can do it down to eight square kilometer pixels. And we're working in Tanzania with 50,000 farmers. And he's got the whole area mapped, and we can see what's going to happen to the weather over the period. We're working with the World Food Program in designing this uh, both production and marketing of the food. And we've got a whole range of partners in there, as you can see, including uh, insurers like Swiss Ray and Willis and so on. And, for, and we've got a small company doing this as well. For, at my age, to start being a, you know, a, a business kind of entrepreneur is really something. Quite scary, actually. Finally, resilience. Just one example of resilience. Uh, this is a farmer in the Sundarbans of India, a woman farmer. She's got rice. 
and she grows root crops and um, if the rice fails she's got the root crops to sell. She's also got a husband and on the left there he's raiding, raising fish fry with his son and he sells those and he's also got as you can see on the right there he's got a little tricycle taxi type thing. So he goes around the village and he will take you on in his on his taxi if you like or take a bag of something or anything else. There's another form of income. Typical of good modern livelihoods. A range of incomes. And when I um, left I looked up and there was a solar panel. And you know one of the things about going to villages is you, you need to ask sort of damn fool questions. You mustn't be afraid of asking the damn fool question. Um, it's difficult for economists, but for people like me, it's quite easy to ask. Uh, and so I looked up there, I saw the solar panel, and I said to the farmer, um, oh, is that a solar panel? I said, yes. He said, uh, what's that for? He looked at me and he said, electricity. <laughs> no, he didn't say electricity dummy, but you could tell that that's what he was going to say, electricity. I said, oh, I said, and why do you want electricity? said, make light bulbs work, he said. You know, he was getting pretty cross at this point. And then I said, why do you want light bulbs to work? He said, because the children do their homework. The children in that village are probably going to do better at school, going to get a job at the end in some little business in some little town nearby and when the next cyclone comes and it did not long after I was there the next cyclone comes they've got something to survive on and that's resilience makes the point that one of the fundamentals of resilience is diversity I've got a lot of questions I mean Mark can answer them all but I, I thought I'd put them up there these are the big questions. How do you evaluate sustainable intensification? How do you evaluate it? Well, most of these sustainable intensification ideas and projects are, um, are, are pushed by people who are absolutely committed to it. And uh, we need proper, clear evaluation. And then the question is, how do you upscale these? How do you put these onto a big scale? It's not, everybody's got their own pet project. Every NGO's got their own pet project. All over Africa, thousands, millions of farmers all doing something that's really quite exciting, but it's only them on their farm and then better land. How do you make that? And then, you know, these are the kind of questions for, for IFPRI, not for me. What are the appropriate political, economic, and social contexts for success? Thank you. This is the final slide. Uh, if you go on our website, which is called agforimpact.org, you can get all of this stuff downloaded for free. And there is that diagram is a data log of 80 successful, in quotes, sustainable intensification projects, which you can look at. Thank you very much.